Hello, and thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar, Choosing a Dynamic Storage Foundation for OpenStack. My name is Corey Hamlet from 451 Research, and I'll be your moderator today. Presenting on today's webinar first will be Henry Balthazar, 451 Research Director of Storage. Henry has evaluated and tested storage hardware and software offerings for nearly 20 years as an industry analyst and as a journalist. He advises clients of data center infrastructure technologies, including storage virtualization, cloud storage, solid state storage, and primary storage arrays. Following Henry will be Daniel Gilfix, Marketing Manager of Storage at Red Hat. Daniel is part of the emerging, emerging storage business unit at Red Hat and is responsible for Red Hat Ceph storage marketing. His career has spanned over two decades, heavily focused on leading edge technologies and integrated software solutions aimed at the enterprise. He was most recently with HP, where he managed cloud and converged infrastructure solutions, strategic alliances with SAP, Microsoft, open source partners, and the sales and enablement needs of direct sellers and the channel. Just a couple of housekeeping items today before we get started. After the two presentations, we will have a Q&A period. To submit a question, just click on the question button within the webinar interface. We will try to get to as many questions as possible, but if you run out of time, someone will get back to you with an answer after the webinar. In addition, a copy of the presentation will be made available to all attendees. We also ask that you provide us with any feedback that you may have from today's presentation. And with that, let's get started. Henry, take it away. Hey, thanks a lot. And um, thank you for your time today. Uh, again, my name is Henry Baltzar. I'm Research Director of Storage at 451. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think right now there's no easy way to sugarcoat this. I mean, if you're a storage professional or if you're an infrastructure professional, it is a tough time for you. Your customer expectations are through the roof. You need to deliver faster. You need to deliver more efficiently. You need to deliver <coughs> higher performance. There are just so many requirements that are coming after you that, it's going to be a tough time, and really, I think one of the main things I hope you take from the presentation is, you know, it's definitely the right time to start looking at changes, start looking at alternatives beyond what you may have been doing for the last couple decades in terms of your storage infrastructure and your infrastructure environment. And when I look at it today, I mean, right now, enterprise storage is, is changing really rapidly. You know, there's definitely a lot of these challenges that we'll be going through in the presentation. You know, there's a combination of really a lot of Relentless data growth, you've got capital expenses, you've got complexity, fragmentational, uh, fragmentation, and a lot of operational overhead that's really forcing people to start re-looking at their architectures and figuring out, you know, is there a better way of doing this? And on top of this all, I mean, as we'll be looking at it, we're also in an area of uh, unprecedented you know, scrutiny in terms of your budgets. And so, really, when you look at it, there's no way to, there's no way to sugarcoat it, as I said. You have to get more out of your budget. You need to start looking at new ways of doing things. You need to start trying to figure out ways to make things more efficient, you know, to make sure that you can keep up, keep up with your customer demand and make sure that you know, as you go into these next generation data centers, you're going to be in the right footing. Uh, a big part of this presentation, obviously, from the title is going to be OpenStack. And OpenStack has emerged as a, a really interesting option, both for service providers and enterprises, especially as they look to build a cloud architecture. And you know, as we look through this and talk about what people are looking at there, you know, I think the one thing we have to remember with cloud is cloud has changed customer expectations. Customers are not willing to wait you know, several days, several weeks, several months to get their applications up and rolling. They need to have their resources quickly. And you know, part of what we talk about today in terms of software-defined storage and you know, the new innovative options uh, that are out there, you know, such as Red Hat's Ceph, I mean, as we start looking at these options, uh, hopefully, I'll make a case for you for why you can be, should be considering these as a potential alternative to maybe some of the hardware appliances that you've been deploying for many years. So going into the first slide here. So this is a survey that we actually took around mid-2015. Uh, so it's a little bit older survey. We actually have some updated survey information right after this. But when we were looking this mid-2015, one of the things we saw, saw when people were projecting their budgets were, you know, a lot of people, well, 50% plan to have very stable spending, you know, meaning they weren't expecting a big increase or decrease in their, in, in their plans. About 40% plan to have an increase in spending. But, I mean, if you look at it, 
really the majority of people, if you factor in that 10% that were actually planning on decreasing spending, you know, really had about 60% of, uh, of the respondents that came in and said, you know what, we're not going to be increasing our spending. Uh, luckily, we took another survey with actually a higher sample size later in the year, or actually middle this year, and one of the things that we found here was, you know, the news is still bad, but not quite as bad. You know, in general, we, we are expecting to see uh, for most, <coughs> uh, in general, what we're expecting to see for most is uh, a slight increase in their budget. You know, in this, in this survey, which had uh, about 623 respondents, as opposed to the last one, which had a little under 200, you know, in this survey, we saw a mean change of about 22% increase which is good. I mean, I think when I, when I saw this number, I was very optimistic because now we're seeing, okay, you know, for those of you that are lucky enough to get a bit of a budget increase, now is definitely a time to push forward. Now is definitely a time uh, to figure out new ways of doing things. Honestly, when I also look at it from the perspective of people that may be getting about the same or a little less, you know, to me, those people also have to make a change, right? Because, you know, simply buying what you bought last year or some, what you bought two years ago probably, it's probably not going to cut it. So you need to find options that are either going to reduce your capex in terms of buying something that's going to be lower dollars per gigabyte, or find something that helps you on the opex side, where you need less people to management, you need less people to provision it, and you know these are some of the issues that we'll be talking about later. Another key point to make, and thing that we saw actually in the more recent surveys also, was the amount of data growth that people were seeing. You know, in, in this survey, we found about 56% of respondents are expecting to see data growth of over 25% or more. So if you take that number, you know, based on the mean that we saw in the previous slide, where we were only increasing about 22%, you know, really we're at this trend or we're at this place where you, you could expect your data grow faster than your budget growth. And while you can factor things like improvements in hard drives and other things like that for dropping some of the cost of storage, really, even with those things, factored, when you start thinking about your data set doubling or tripling in a couple of years, it's definitely going to be a situation where you need to start making changes. You know, for many organizations I've talked to, they've come to the realization as well that, you know, right now it's really unsustainable. They can't do things the same way. They have to start thinking differently, and they have to figure out better ways of both managing storage and also reducing the cost of managing storage. So, in terms of what, what's going on with storage today, it's definitely a growing burden within environments. You know, storage professionals are dealing with a lot more capacity, and they're, you know, the problem is they wind up spreading themselves thin, trying to deal with provisioning, trying to deal with troubleshooting, trying to deal with optimization. It's, getting a, it's becoming a harder and harder job. You know, when we look at the previous survey results from 2011-2014, you know, the, the average mean that we've seen in terms of the amount of capacity being managed Per storage administrator has gone up a lot. <laughs> you know, over the, over those previous years, there was maybe about 20% growth they were dealing with. Now, the amount that people are having to manage is much more higher in terms of you know 75% in the last survey in terms of how much more capacity they had to manage. Well, when I think about this, there's a lot of different reasons why uh, this problem is getting worse. I mean, let me get to the next slide to show this. Well, when we look at it, the, the key pain point right now is still rapid capacity growth. And I think the reason why this problem begets, becomes worse and worse and worse year after year is you have to start thinking about, well, what's going on in the environment? Well, one of the things is a lot of you are going to be subjected to compliance, which means you can't, <laughs> in many cases, you can't delete data or you can't delete data very easily. So that's going to become a big issue. Another major factor that we're seeing in organizations why they're holding on to data is you know, the rise of big data analytics and, and other uh, you know, forms of analytics where you're trying to get, extract more value out of the data. You know, with those initiatives in place, companies are just more reluctant to throw away data that they may have thrown away a couple years ago because they may be able to feed that into an analytics engine, they may be able to find some competitive advantage, or they may be able to see something from that data. That's forcing people to, uh, on the administrator side, that's forcing them to manage more data, and I think that's one of the big issues that we're seeing. When we're looking at the top pain points in terms of storage today, number one is still that rapid capacity growth, which we talked about. Another key issue is you know, the ones that, that I highlight here. And the reason I highlighted these issues here is 
those, these issues that I highlight in green are also the main issues that are forcing people to start looking at cloud-like architectures or even cloud services to deal, to deal with some of their issues. You know, a lot of people are complaining about the high cost of storage. A lot of people are complaining that, hey, as we build these new environments, we may not have the right skills and staffing to, to stay up to date. They may not have the SAN architect expertise in-house yet. But, but if it's a mid-sized company that's growing up, you know, they, they have to make a decision. Are we going to go with the more uh, traditional architecture and go with fiber channel and expensive proprietary storage systems, or are we going to try to consider other options uh, at our disposal? The other uh, key issues are, you know, if you look at a lot of environments, and we'll be talking about this very shortly, a lot of environments today are, are built out of multiple different platforms. Even if you buy from a single vendor, often a single vendor will have five or six different platforms uh, just to cover their different ranges. And the problem there is not only is it disparate storage management, each of these individual platforms wind up becoming silos within the organization, which are very difficult to manage, and also the silos don't share resources. So if you make a bad decision, you wind up having storage sitting around that probably shouldn't be there. And yeah, that also leads to other factors. With proprietary storage especially, you know, a lot of times you may have aged equipment. Maybe it's equipment that's been sitting around for a while. Maybe it's equipment you have uh, inherited in an acquisition. You know, those, are, those are other top issues that customers are looking at and also reasons why people want to make changes uh, to go beyond where we've, been, uh, where we've been at at the storage market. So moving right along. In terms of the drivers of uh, capacity growth, I think the big issue here and the big thing to look at is I, I think sometimes Customers don't think they don't, they're not going to have a big storage issue. Some of them think, hey, I'm not running a motion picture studio. I don't have a ton of video data. I don't have a ton of all this unstructured data or all these areas. But the thing is, if you look at why things are growing, most organizations are going to be affected by that. Organic growth is going to affect everybody. A lot of people are looking at analytics now, even small companies. That's probably going to be a big issue. You know, another thing is server virtualization. Everybody pretty much has server virtualization. So that's probably going to wind up affecting you if you're, if you're looking at your organization. What was interesting to me is that you know, new business applications and multimedia and some of these more next generation things were relatively lower down the list in terms of what was the main major factors for driving capacity growth. You know, and when I look at this, it's definitely an area where more likely than not you're going to be affected by the growth. Now is the right time to start figuring out what you're going to do with all that data, how you're going to make it more actionable, and also, how are you going to make it more efficient to hold on to this data for longer periods of time? Okay, so when we're looking at also key projects, and this is another key area which highlights cloud, uh, cloud architectures, both private and public cloud. You know, the number one project that customers were looking at deploying in 2016 was improving their backup and DR strategy. You know, that's definitely a key area. You know, to me, I think, we have to really evolve our mindset in terms of what, what DR is, what DR as a service is, what these capabilities are. Right now, we, we pretty much sell it on this basic premise of, hey, it's insurance. You want to be able to have something running uh, in case of a data center emergency or operating system error or, uh, or hardware going down. You want to have this insurance policy to run that. I think that's a short-sighted way of seeing it, though. If you look deeper into these technologies and what they actually do, you know, DR technologies are really about workload migration, right? It's about replicating a workload. It's about doing the integrity check. It's about understanding what you have in a particular environment and what you need to move it to a cloud environment. I think as we start expanding our private cloud deployments and start leveraging uh, more technologies like OpenStack and all the other things that are disposable, we're going to start looking at that a stepping stone between backup and DR to real workload migration. I think really when you start thinking about your hybrid cloud strategy, those are the key things you're going to need to do. It's really, as we try to become more cloud-like, we have to make sure that you know, the private cloud has the ability you know, to match and uh, has the ability to match and be able to accept you know, workloads you may have on premise. So that's going to be a key ingredient. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later when we talk about what's going on with software to find storage. Okay, so now, as I uh, preluded, we're really gonna, this next section is going to be talking more about what's going on and towards the shift to becoming more cloud-like. You know, really, 
when I look at this chart, the main thing I see is, you know what, on-prem is not going to go away anytime soon. You know, while there's definitely been a lot of advances made in, in private cloud or public cloud services and other things like that, you know, by and large, we're not seeing uh, those services, you know, significantly, you know, there's no, there's no near term where you're not going to have on-premises resources, uh, at least for some of the larger enterprises we talk to, especially in very compliance sensitive areas such as financial services. A lot of those guys are not going to be moving to cloud services anytime soon. They may be moving parts of it out there. They may be moving things like test dev. They may be moving some things like some of the analytics and maybe mobile applications. But a lot of the key core applications are probably going to be more in a, uh, if anything, they're going to be more in a private cloud setting or an on-premise setting where customers are going to still have control of those assets and be able to control those uh, uh, applications and data. You know, when we look at this survey, you know, we're going to see a little drop in terms of on-premise non-cloud. You know, that's going to evolve into more cloud-like environments, but you know, from there we're, we're expecting to see within the next couple of years of going from 53.8% to about 37.8%. If you look at what is the area that really grew, hosted private cloud is one area that grew, 6.8 uh, you know, to 11.6. You know, but really there's a lot of growth here in terms of on-premises private cloud where, where customers are still trying to use uh, uh, capabilities like OpenStack to be able to uh, have a cloud-like environment, have a cloud environment in their on-premises data centers under their control. They are going from 16.5% to 20, 21%. You know, obviously, if you look at uh, infrastructure as service, there was definitely a bump up there as well, 7% uh, to 8.7%. You know, as part of your private cloud strategy, you should be looking to integrate that where possible. But you know, again, you know, based on what we've seen from the infrastructure folks, you know, by and large, a lot of this is going to be still on-premise, and a lot of it's still going to be private cloud going into the future. Now, digging deeper, a little, uh, digging more deeper into uh, OpenStack, you know, clearly when we asked about uh, 462 people in this survey, how uh, what their uh, budget expectations were for OpenStack, you know, 39.8% said they were going to increase, 57.8, we're going to remain the same. You know, so clearly. <clears throat> It's still an area where you know, people are making investments and people are looking to figure out uh, how to get more out, how to get more out of their infrastructure using OpenStack. So, in terms of what are the drivers of OpenStack, you know, right now we, we're still seeing a strong demand from enterprises and service providers who are looking at this as their potential cloud architecture. You know, there's definitely <coughs> uh, a lot of the capabilities that are built into there will help with a lot of these issues that we talked about in terms of provisioning time, your flexibility and agility, all those types of things, you know, which are really the business benefits for going to a cloud. You know, the, public, the private cloud appeal, there's a couple different things there. People still want to have control of their information. You know, some people have compliance concerns or security concerns. You know, and even in people that have adopted uh, public cloud resources, we have seen a significant percentage, I think it was about 30% or our last survey, People that went to private cloud and actually wound up repatriating their data either back to on-premises or to uh, hosted uh, uh, private clouds. So you know, while there's definitely growth in the cloud services space, you know, customers want to have flexibility. I think OpenStack is going to be a big part of this. And, and obviously the other key element is OpenStack is an open alternative in terms of open source and all the benefits you get from the open source community. So next section, I'm going to be diving in, uh, diving a bit deeper into what is software-defined storage, how this is going to provide flexibility to you. Um, and with that, I'm going to start with a little bit of a history lesson first for, for those of you who aren't, aren't, may, not, may not be uh, storage pros for all these years. So if you look at, in terms of why this is important, you know, when we did the survey, about 54% believe that their architecture is going to be more software-defined. And you know, I think part of that is you know, people need to have more flexibility. If you look at what's going on with legacy architectures, I think the biggest problem in storage, and I've been covering storage for 20 years, so I've seen this unfold, unfortunately. The, the horrors of this unfolding, I've been watching this for 20 years. But the biggest problem in storage is storage companies don't solve problems without introducing new platforms, right? Even though the majority of what we still deploy today is still enterprise NAS or fiber channel arrays, when new problem sets come about, the storage industry's response is to create a totally new platform to deal with that new capability. So right now we're in the middle of seeing the all-flash array 
segment blossom. For a lot of those all flash arrays, especially the early ones, those were built on totally different technologies and they didn't really share a code base with some of the legacy stuff, though we've seen some improvements in that area. Uh, if you start looking at some of the other places like Scaleout NAS, Scaleout NAS in general is usually a, a totally different platform from what other company, what, what company might have used for conventional NAS. You know, and the problem between these sets is these wind up creating really rigid silos in the environment, which makes it very difficult. So you wind up getting these uncomfortable questions on the storage administrator like, hey, I ran out of storage for database. And you know, the CIO asked, well, you just spent $2 million in scale-out NAS. Well, you, know, you have to go back and explain, well, scale-out NAS is for unstructured data. It doesn't do the database storage that we're supposed to do. And you know, again, it, it becomes this issue where you know, storage administrators are put in a tough space. Not only do you have to pick the right tool, you have to pick the right amount of each tool to be able to do it. And that, to me, winds up becoming a very painful issue, which I've tried to illustrate here a little bit on topology. You know, for the poor storage administrator at the bottom, you ultimately wind up juggling these resources off these different silos. You, know, you might have a high-performance thing like a fiber channel fan. You know, that's great. You, know, you could buy a ton of that, but you're also paying a lot more dollar per gigabyte on that fiber channel fan compared to some of the cheaper options like an enterprise NAS or, or even some scale-out NAS or even object storage where you're potentially paying pennies per gigabyte for something like that. So the big issue here is you know, as a storage administrator, you, you don't necessarily know all the time what's coming in or at least you don't know when you're building your budget at the beginning of the year. So ultimately, for a lot of these poor storage admins, they wind up guessing. And a lot of times they wind up guessing on the heavy side because you know, while they may be wasting money potentially on that you know, expensive fiber channel array or all flash array on the left-hand side, they know at least that will have a better potential of covering whatever walks in the door. And, but I think to me that guessing game needs to stop. I think we need to have more flexible options going forward and software defined storage is going to be more of a better way of doing that I think as we go into the future. When I start looking at the future with software defined storage, I think a big part of this is going to be built on the bottom end where, where we're replacing, or really not, we're not eliminating a storage administrator, but we're trying to re replace a storage administrator for things like provisioning. And that's where we start seeing service catalogs and provisioning engines and all the really cool things that are being built into OpenStack and all these cloud environments. You know, when we get to this level, what's good is your users will be able to choose from a portal, your applications will be able to request using APIs, and what's good about this is the service catalog will have that ability to you know, say what's available and automatically provision that, which is going to be great because you know, people just don't want to sit around and wait for resources anymore. They want to have that flexibility of software-defined storage to be able to build these things. I think the other aspect about this is as we go into software-defined storage and treating uh, you know, storage more as an application instead of arrays and rigid appliances, that's where you're going to have more ability to start using these resources more more efficiently. You know, like why buy an all flash array that's going to run maybe one month on Black Friday? Well, wouldn't it be better if we could create a virtual all flash array out of flash resources you have? You'll be able to run that and then when it's done, disperse that into other or into other use cases. You know, that's how service providers do it and I think that's how we're going to have to move to make cloud environments more uh, you know, make infrastructure environments more cloud-like. You know, so in this area here, yeah, the, the main thing here is as we get to using more commodity resources like commodity SSDs, commodity hard drives, you're going to be able to drop the pricing because you know, these commodity resources are going to be a fraction of the cost of what you pay your traditional storage dealer for the same exact SanDisk or Toshiba or Micron SSD. So you know, one of the benefits there is you'll be able to afford more of that, more of that capacity you know, for less. And as we start going to software-defined storage and start using more things like potentially Ceph and some of the other options out there, you'll be able to create the resources you need to create uh, in a timely manner, which I think is going to be very powerful. You know, so here, in this case, you'll have, uh, you know, just to walk through the diagram, you'll have requests coming in through the bottom. Those will be fed into your software-defined storage pool, and the pool will be able to create these resources based on if it's high performance, they'll put more flash in it, if it's more flash in controllers, if it's more of a cheap and deep, you know, they can move that to SATA drives and lower processor, lower power processors. Yeah, and that will allow us to be able to you know, get beyond some of the silos we've had. Yeah, I'll be frank. It's going to take a while for us to get to this stage, I believe. 
you know, the majority of people still like to buy appliances, but uh, but we were definitely seeing an uptick in software-defined storage uh, over the last couple of years. It's going to be a long climb, but really, I think the faster you get on this, the faster you start moving towards this, uh, the more flexible your environment is going to be uh, going forward. And a lot of the main storage vendors are doing it now, so it's great that there's more validation in the market to move towards this model. So in terms of what do you need, if you're going to go software-defined storage, there are a couple of things you need to keep uh, be mindful of. You need to have resiliency, right? You need to have a platform that has data integrity in it, scrubbing required, to make sure that you know, data that's sitting there is not getting corrupted or, or it gets corrupted and you don't even know it. These type of data integrity things are very important, and we're starting to see you know, you know, many of the platforms have this today, so that's good, but you know, that's definitely something you want to look out for in terms of what you have there. You know, again, you also want to look at um, architectures that potentially use replicas and, and other ways of protecting data. Uh, you know, snapshots are also very important there, which we also talk about in the data protection section. But in cloud environments, a lot of times we, we do see a lot of mirroring there. And with the lower cost of commodity hardware, you can get away with doing that. Uh, there's also other key technologies that have been deployed, like erasure coding, to reduce that cost uh, of uh, uh, of uh, maintaining these data sets for long periods of time. You know, the other key aspect is about performance. You, know, you really need to look for a platform that's going to find a way to either to optimize flash storage and not only optimize for flash storage, but also make sure that whatever performance I paid for, I'm divvying that out in the most efficient way possible. Right? You want to make sure when you're creating your storage classes that you know, an organization is going to get what they, what they pay for and not over-deliver if you don't have to, <laughs> right? I mean, because the thing is, if you over-deliver on the low end, those low end guys are never going to pay up for the premium service. So there has to be financial discipline in this. And then part of that, is, I think that's a big part of what we look at for performance. Another key area is also data protection, as I mentioned, snapshots and replication being you know, key features there. Okay, going into the future, yeah, one of the big things we've seen in the last couple of years especially is automation. Uh, increasing. I, I think a lot of people, I'll be frank, when I talk to a lot of storage administrators, a lot of them are terrified of automation. They're afraid of automating their way out of a job. But really, I think that's the wrong way of looking at it, unfortunately. Um, you know, the future is going to be about automation and being able to satisfy customers. And it's better to have control of that and have input in the direction of automation than having automation done to you later. So really, now is the right time to look at automation not be fearful of it. Yeah, because your job is going to get worse year after year after year. Your job will get worse in terms of the amount you have to manage and the resources they're giving you to manage it. You need to start being proactive about it. Automation is going to be a key way of looking at this, especially for uh, dynamic applications that scale up and which need to scale up and scale down rapidly. Another key thing that we're looking at is machine learning. We're seeing a lot more tools being built with machine learning capabilities in there, and that's going to be another key capability to start looking out for. Uh, out for, especially in the next couple of years. You know, with the machine learning, it will give you a better idea of what are some of the problems, potential problems in your environment, what are potential solutions to deal with those problems. And the key thing here is you want to be able to predict these things and nip these things in the bud so they never become main issues. You know, customers have very, very little uh, tolerance for downtime these days. They even have very little tolerance for uh, slowdowns, <laughs> even if your machine happens to be running just a little bit slower. Customers notice that much more rapidly now. Customers complain about that more. You need to start using these tools like machine learning and automation to be able to take, take advantage of these changes going forward. Yeah, and, and thank you again. I'm going to be passing this off to Daniel, who's going to be talking a bit more about Ceph. You know, Ceph is definitely a, a key option uh, that's, that's been very popular in the open source environment. Uh, and there's a lot of key capabilities here, which uh, Daniel is going to be going over in, in, his, in the next part of this presentation. All right. Uh, thanks. All right. Thank you, Henry. Um, hey, everyone. My, my name is Daniel Gilfix. Uh, I'm from the Red Hat Storage Business Unit. In fact, some of you may have been expecting Ross Turk today, but Ross got sent away to yet another CEPH opportunity out of town and, in fact, out of country. So, so I get the distinct honor of talking to you all about this important topic concerning um, OpenStack and software-defined storage. And a admittedly, my perspective is centered around CEPH, it's one of the key software-defined storage options at your disposal that Henry mentioned. 
and has been recognized by 451 in a recent study about OpenStack support. Okay, so just as a logical follow-up to uh, Henry's discussion on 451's own analysis, I thought it would be a nice juxtaposition to introduce even more recent survey results from the work we commissioned through Vance and Bourne out of the UK. Now, Vance and Bourne had a series of extensive interviews with a broad cross-section of IT decision makers. This was done worldwide, and it was really about the, the role of storage specifically and how important these folks felt it was in their IT environments. You might have read about it uh, in, um, in, a, in a blog we did a couple months ago, and we even had a, a short webinar last month. But essentially what it shows is that storage is becoming recognized, at least among those in the trenches, as a critical pain point across the board. Most folks feel that their organizations are pretty much ill-prepared to roll out applications and solutions with their current storage capabilities, particularly with newer workloads like OpenStack. On the plus side, however, most of these same folks are, are highly optimistic, as you can see on the right side of the slide, just about how much more they could achieve if their storage were more agile, which is precisely what is promised by software-defined storage and, in particular, in this context of OpenStack, Ceph storage. Which leads us directly here. Red Hat Ceph storage is software-defined storage that is distributed. It's enterprise-grade. It's been successfully deployed worldwide. Like OpenStack, it's designed to run on commodity hardware, or sometimes folks call it industry standard hardware. Uh, it does so very efficiently. It saves a lot of folks, a lot of customers, a lot of money. It's also massively scalable. It's capable of managing petabytes of data with little, if any, performance degradation. And it's found a strong niche, surprisingly enough, or not surprisingly enough, in, in, in cloud and emerging wor workloads like OpenStack. Now, Red Hat Ceph storage is based on Ceph, and that's the open source product that became quite familiar uh, and quite popular when, while it was part of Ink Tank which was acquired along with all of its Ceph experts in 2014 by Red Hat. Ceph is a self-healing storage system. It empowers the storage admin by exposing all of its functions via APIs, making, making it easier to automate and easier to integrate with other tools. Now we've integrated it with our own tool called the Red Hat Storage Console 2. And the benefit of this console is generally uh, improved usability across the board thanks to its intuitive interface and allows customers to install, manage, and monitor the, the Ceph storage infrastructure through a single pane of glass. And what it does is it grabs real-time data from the Ceph Calamari data service, and it means that the users can be proactive, proactive about monitoring and managing the health, the performance, and the capacity utilization of their Ceph cluster. As it relates to OpenStack, Ceph storage is tightly integrated with OpenStack's modular architecture and components. This means it offers a unified and efficient platform to support both persistent and ephemeral block, object, and now file storage. It's wired into the major OpenStack data services, including Nova, Cinder, Glance, Keystone, Swift, and as of the most recent version, Manila. The other thing of particular interest I'd like to point out is the fact that it's a really good fit for MySQL, for database as a service. And in fact, we've been working with Percona, and they're one of the leading database consultants and software providers for MySQL, and generating our own reference architectures to optimize this integration. Last but certainly not least uh, is the fact that Red Hat started bundling Ceph into the Red Hat OpenStack platform uh, earlier this year. So every unique customer account gets a one-time additional entitlement of 64 terabytes of Ceph with their subscription to an OpenStack platform. Technically, some of the key advantages for an OpenStack user are, are 
are listed here. First and foremost is speed of instantiation. Because CephRBD is wired into OpenStack services, users can clone a golden OpenStack image that's stored in Glance and make it instantly accessible to any Nova Compute hypervisor as the boot ephemeral volume. Clones can also come from a running instance, uh, a running image in Nova, or an existing block device in Cinder. In all instances, in all cases, the data is cloned right away. It's instantaneous in Ceph, and it allows the VM to have immediate access to it. So when a user or users request the distribution of 100 or 1,000 copies of a VM for use on 100 or 1,000 servers, the image is instantly cloned on the cluster and made available immediately. This means that all these VMs can start as quickly as the processor can boot the kernel. Why is this important? Because when you're using OpenStack, uh, you know, folks want their cloud resources available immediately. And unfortunately, traditional storage and even Amazon, it requires, they require copying of the images across the network to where you want to run the VM before they can boot up. Ceph does not. The very nature of Ceph's architecture innately allows rapid VM creation at large scale. And while you're at it, you know, backups are also instantaneous. Snapshots of the VM's block storage can be made in seconds. Images can be copied with zero data migration. Replication can occur across multiple sites to meet disaster recovery or archival requirements. And, and finally, Ceph is cool. It allows for tiered I.O. performance. It allows it for, in an intelligent manner on multiple service tiers for different workloads on the same cluster. All of these features have contributed to Ceph being the overwhelming preferred storage solution for OpenStack in every OpenStack.org survey that I can remember as far back as uh, at least past two, three years. They apply to pilots, QA, and actual production. The results that you see here were, were just released at OpenStack Summit Barcelona. They are actually a couple points higher than the results back in April that were released uh, in Austin, OpenStack Summit there. In some, we're talking about a trend that doesn't seem to be letting up. When it comes to OpenStack, Ceph is almost becoming a de facto choice. Services for Red Hat Ceph storage extend from standard Red Hat subscriptions all the way to training. And in, and in many cases, they're what separates upstream from downstream deployment. Since Ceph and OpenStack users always have the option of using pure OpenStack and pure open source uh, instantiations of, of the product. In fact, a lot of folks forget how much value is inherent in the Red Hat subscription through which our products are distributed. There's automated product access, a number of deployment resources, a full what we call a knowledge base of information that pertains to the products and best practices that we've documented. There's streamlined release and product lifecycle management. And there are several dimensions of security and certification and accountability that becomes very important for solutions when you roll them out in, in full enterprise deployment. Beyond the actual subscriptions, there are also a number of Red Hat Global support and Red Hat storage consulting options that are shown here, such as Jumpstart, Health Check, and our new consulting discovery session, which can help users implement Ceph and OpenStack together in a smart way, efficiently on the right architecture based on documented reference architectures and other best practices. And lastly, you know, in as much as it's rather essential for the user, the user base, uh, to understand the ins and outs of these products, we offer two and five day training to share much of this knowledge with your staff. We've got a lot of uh, examples of customer success with uh, OpenStack and, and Ceph together. Uh, here's one that I figured I would show because we issued a press release about it last week. It's UK Cloud, and they provide a public cloud, uh, not surprisingly, for a variety of public sector organizations in the UK, including defense, police, justice, and, and healthcare. 
And in fact, I'm pretty sure that they're considered the foremost public cloud provider for the UK government. Anyway, the organization needed to expand their support for their clients to innovate, and they decided to go ahead and standardize on Red Hat OpenStack platform and Red Hat Ceph Storage together. Now, part of the reason they, they elected to go this way was because of our consulting services. Part of it was our experience and reliability developing secure, production-ready IaaS types of, of platforms. Part was obviously product quality and selection, since the customer, they wanted Ceph and OpenStack. But as often is the case, it's the solution provider that can make the difference. And in this case, we work with them, we help them get into production in under six months, all with the, the levels of scalability and performance that they were expecting. Here are a, a slew of pointers to our consulting organization, our training site, as well as uh, the Red Hat uh, storage test drive. It's a pretty nifty place you can go with no commitment, no expense, to explore the management, scalability, and the portability features of, of, of Ceph on AWS in real time. The test drive that we've got, it's, it's set up in short, easily digestible modules, and each one describes a key function of the Ceph cluster. If, by the way, you know you just prefer the phone and you want to talk to somebody right away about Ceph, either by itself or in the context of OpenStack, uh, you can give us a call at one of the numbers here, and we'd be ha happy to talk to you. So, therein lies uh, that's the rest of my pitch. I I'd like to send this back to Corey and see if we have any any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, Daniel and Henry. Um, it's now time for our Q&A period. If you have a question, just click on the question button to submit it. And we have a few questions here. Uh, the first one looks like it's for Daniel. Um, you seem to imply that services are necessary with Ceph. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, this is a pretty quick question, and it's uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it would be great to tell folks that software is plug and play, and you know, even a caveman can do it, but that's just not reality. And oftentimes, it's the stuff with the most power and has the most potential that gets people frustrated when they don't know what they're doing. And Ceph is really powerful stuff. It's certainly not something that the layman can deploy completely blind. OpenStack 2 is, is complicated to configure, and you put the two of them together, that can make things even more challenging. So if you're not familiar with either one or both, it can be, again, a challenge. Plus, folks have a lot of misconceptions about Ceph and OpenStack, like they're completely easy to set up, you don't need detailed planning, you don't need to do architectural design, uh, you can use your existing storage arc, uh, infrastructure, uh, the, the folks who are there, the server folks can just handle it. Sometimes they think that going with community bits is better because everyone thinks they're cutting edge. Uh, these are these are things that just aren't true, and they're the reason that a lot of folks get into problems, and that's why we always stress getting our consulting services folks involved at the beginning. And, and it doesn't have to be an onerous expense, but we really do care about customer satisfaction, and we'd much rather that we work with you to evaluate, evaluate your expertise and what you're trying to do and your preparedness and options that you've got to, to pursue uh, your goals rather than you getting frustrated down the road because the product didn't live up to expectations or the products, which could very well be just because folks didn't know what they were doing. Thank you, Daniel. Um, next question. We've been buying appliances for decades. Why should we consider going to software to find storage? I'll take that. I mean, that's something we talked a little bit about during the presentation. Appliances are still the primary form factor by which people buy these things. They like the idea, the, the integrated aspect of it and manageability. But really, I think the sacrifices you make in terms of being in a closed configuration, you know, the price you pay for hard drives and capacity, if you look at a lot of these things on a CapEx basis and, you know, all these other capabilities, you, there's, it's time to start looking at the software-defined part of this. And it's t time to start leveraging your ability to take advantage of commodity hardware. There's amazing things happening in commodity hardware, even in the disk drive level. A lot of really cool things happening in Flash. 
And one of the things I encourage people to do is, well, if you can do this on a software basis and have an, like an open source community that's quick to react and quick to support things, that gives you a better opportunity to innovate at your pace. You don't have to wait for a storage vendor E or D to say you could use these drives or this flash. Innovate at your pace. Take advantage of the best hardware, uh, whether it be processors, RAM, CPUs, all these things that make your storage run better. I think with those things in mind, we're going to start seeing more of a transition to software-defined storage as people become more, more familiar with the model. Thanks, Henry. Um, Daniel, you didn't talk much about partners. Is the Red Hat OpenStack Ceph solution mostly homegrown? Uh, the answer to this is no. Um, look, both, both Ceph and OpenStack come from the open source community. The very nature of open source means an open ecosystem. And, you know, the open source community, it drives to, towards innovation, quality, an open development process, and collaborative engagement which means Ceph and OpenStack users, they don't really need to worry about the advance of the products or being locked into any one company. So at the same time, we're working with an expanded list of partners on tested, certified, uh, supported variations of Red Hat Ceph storage uh, to broaden customer choice. Uh, partners like Mellanox, Supermicro, Sandisk, Samsung, Intel, Dell, QCT, uh, Percona I mentioned before. Uh, we just uh, did something with Cisco and uh, Permabit uh, and you know a bunch of others. It, it's front and center in our charter. And I think it's, it's a far cry from traditional storage vendors, which, like it or not, they tend to propagate and cling to proprietary solutions, which with what many folks consider to be an exclusive ecosystem. And in general, this isn't what open source customers want, and it's not what Red Hat wants for our customers. So it's not just homegrown. We couldn't do this without our partners. Thank you, Daniel. Um, what, else should we, would be, should, what else should we be doing to modernize our infrastructure? I'll take a stab at this, but uh, yeah. I think one of the big things that I did, for, actually I forgot to mention was well, I think one of the things that to me, we talked a little bit about you need to have financial discipline within your environments. And I think part of that is the fact that you know, when you look at surveys, only maybe 30% of or so respondents say that you charge back or show back, which to me is criminally low. <laughs> I mean, you can't create these automated environments where you have no discipline in terms of ramifications for deploying things, right? It would be like you know taking a bunch of kids and bunch of kids and throwing them in a candy store. You know you know what's going to happen there. <laughs> it's not going to be what you thought was going to happen. So really, I think you start you need to start looking at these tools and start figuring out ways to implement showback or chargeback. So you know customers know what it costs to use things and they know the consequences of leaving you know a tap running. Uh, you know, leaving the water running. And I think that's another key thing you have to look at when you try to modernize your infrastructure. Thank you, Henry. Um, aren't, there, are, aren't there other options for Ceph? If so, why Red Hat? It looks like I should be the one answering this one. Um, yeah, well, with any source, any open source offerings, uh, customers do have a choice. They've got a choice between upstream and downstream. Uh, a lot of customers continue to use the product in its pure open source form because they're sold on its features. Uh, we talked about these, but you know, Ceph offers unified storage. Storage. It's massively scalable. It has the integration with OpenStack services that we talked about. This rapid provisioning, the support for commodity hardware, the no single point of failure, and the list goes on and on. However, there, there comes, often comes a point, um, and uh, indeed a lot of customers, for them, the point is up front. They elect to go with commercial variation. And yeah, Red Hat is not the only one. But Red Hat is the only one with the ink tank legacy. Uh, we are the leading Ceph authority and the leading code contributor. We've got full solution stacks with things like Red Hat Cloud Suite and Red Hat OpenStack Platform on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. 
uh, along with years of customer experience, uh, open source experience, uh, Ceph experience across the globe. So, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, I really think that we mix and match the best of both worlds as the strongest proponent and supporter of the open source community with a steadfast commitment to our commercial customers, along with added features, the subscription benefits and that I talked about, and the support that these customers need to go into production. So that's why. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, how will private cloud change the roles of the people working in my organization? I'll take a stab at that. I think that's one of the fears that people look at. As we start going to private clouds and we start making things more automated, you may not need as many storage administrators on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know, clearly the storage administrators you have need to be really, really good because <laughs> you know, they need to be able to manage a large set of data. They need to have the ability to script. They need to have the ability to you know, make sure they can look after a lot of these things. I think as we go to these private clouds also, it becomes more and more important for, like, if you're in a solid environment where you have a dedicated networking team, server team, application team, storage team, those teams have to work closer together. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts there. And I think as you start looking at that, it, I think that's where the, there is some power in terms of what you can do with an OpenStack implementation where you can have this so if everything's set up correctly, you could get by using more generalist, which is good, but really a lot of the big decisions, I think you're going to st still need some of the specialists. All right, looks like we have time, in, uh, time for uh, one more question here. Um, if I'm thinking of implementing OpenStack, do I necessarily need storage? And if so, why can't I use what I already have? That one might be for Henry. Oh, okay. I thought that was for... All right. Uh, today, you know, I think the thing is, when you go to these cloud environments where you want to be flexible, you want to be able to deliver things quickly, you know, appliances are not always the best choice for that. You know, again, with a software-defined environment and your ability to leverage these resources, it gives you that ability to create a resource instead of just allocating it to the right bucket of storage. You know, I'm not going to say that you can't use uh, conventional storage because you know, a lot of these players have added you know, cinder drivers and other capabilities like that. But you know, to me, that's really more of a legacy thing that we'll have for a while. I think as you go forward and you start building more of these clouds, it's, it's going to lean more towards you know, you know, the trends are going more towards commodity hardware and more of a software-defined type environment, especially for these places where you need to have agility. So while you can use you know, conventional, traditional storage in these environments, if they have OpenStack uh, support you know, for some of these different protocols, while that's possible, it, it may not be the best choice long-term for what you want to do in terms of creating an agile and flexible environment. To totally agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would have basically said the same thing, that for all the reasons that we talked about before, uh, traditional storage is just not designed for OpenStack. OpenStack is it, it's it requires the type of storage that that Soft offers. Software-defined storage is designed for uh, scale out. It's designed for commodity hardware, and 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 increasingly, it's designed specifically for OpenStack. And if you put traditional storage with OpenStack, it's kind of like running. Uh, an incredible car on square wheels. It hampers you. All right. Well, thank you, Henry and Daniel. Um, it looks like that's all the time we have today for questions. On behalf of today's present, uh, presenters, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, and we hope to see you again on another webinar in, in the future. Thank you, and have a great day.